Hey guys, so for today's lecture, I'm going to be going over the blood pressure notes and I will be posting them for you guys. So let's go ahead and get started. So hopefully you guys can see my screen. Let me just zoom in a little bit more. So today we're gonna to be talking about the blood pressure or your blood pressure lab. So on the agenda for today, we're gonna to be going over the cardiovascular system, the blood vessels, um, systemic circuit, the recording of blood pressure or MAP, blood pressure abnormalities, uh, cardiac cycle, and any physiological factors that affect the blood pressure, um, the cardiovascular center and the receptors, the autonomic nervous system, and then the regulation of this mean arterial pressure. And then I will be giving you guys a brief overview of what your experiment next week will be on. So we're going to be starting off with the cardiovascular system. Let me stop. So you guys remember the cardiovascular system um, is made up of the heart, the blood vessels, and then your blood. So again, here's an image of your heart. The middle portion here is called the septum. It divides the left and right halves. And then as you guys know, the heart is the um, main um, component that pumps blood throughout the body. And then you have the blood vessels or the arteries, capillaries, and then your veins. And these blood vessels are found in the pulmonary and systemic circulation. So as you guys remember the pulmonary um, circuit, you start at the venous, vena cavae on this side, and you have deoxygenated blood. You enter into the right atrium, go down the right ventricle, up into the pulmonary arteries, and now you're at the lungs. And then now the lungs convert the deoxygenated blood into oxygenated blood. The oxygenated blood then is able to come into the pulmonary vein. And then it enters the heart on the left atrium. And then now we're at the left ventricle and we are able to move outwards um, in the aorta. And then now we are able to flow into our various portions of our body, and this is what is known as systemic circulation. So again, the cardiovascular system is made up of the blood, which is formed elements and the plasma. So a little bit of information on blood vessels. So as I mentioned before, there's the arteries, and these are the components that make up your arteries. Um, you have the outer coat, you have an elastic tissue, and then you guys have smooth muscle cells. Then again, another layer of elastic tissue, basement membrane, and then finally the endothelium. Um, it's very similar with the arterioles. You have an outer coat, you have a smooth muscles, and then you also have the basement membrane, and again, the endothelium. As for the capillaries, they only contain the basement membrane and an endothelium portion. And then the veins contain an outer coat, Again, the smooth muscles, basement membrane, and the endothelium, and then a valve. So the purpose of the valve in the vein is so that when blood is flowing through, the blood doesn't go in the opposite direction. It just continues in one direction. Um, as a side note, um, like I mentioned before, you have your smooth muscles. These smooth muscles are unstrated. Um, and by unstrated, it basically just means that they are not highly organized. Um, as you can see in this image here, they're going in various directions. They're not very neatly packed or anything like that. And then when a postganglionic neuron um, communicates with them, it's able to communicate with various um, regions of these smooth muscles because they contain multiple nodes. So that's just a little side note for you guys. So as for blood vessels, again, you have your heart, you have arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, and then your veins. Um, the vasculature, also known as the arrangement of these blood vessels, um, again, it's with the heart, and then you move down the line. Um, they 
Blood vessels consist of these smooth muscles um, with the exception of the capillaries, and it also contains the connective tissues. So a little bit about the arteries. They are fairly big, they branch, and then their main job is to pull blood away from the heart. And the biggest artery is the aorta. Uh, if you guys would like me to show you that, I could as well, just so you guys know where it's located at. So again, um, here's your heart. And then the biggest artery is the aorta, which is located at the base of the heart. And then you have your arterioles, which are small branching vessels, and they have high resistance. By high resistance, this basically means that the blood that is flowing through um, has difficulty flowing through um, the arterioles. As for capillaries, this is the site of the exchange between the blood and the tissues. And then you have your venial, venials, which are small vessels that collect blood from the capillary, and then it joins to form these veins. Um, they're less toned and they have less resistance, so blood is able to flow smoothly. As for the veins, they have a larger radius, um, and their job is to conduct the blood towards the heart. Um, the inferior vena cavae is the largest vein, and again, that is located at the base of the heart, the vena cavae right here on the right side. So now moving on to the arteries, um, they are a pressure, pressure reservoir. So what does this mean? Um, basically, when your heart is at rest, um, the arteries are the main circulation that drives the blood. And that's because most of the pressure is coming from the arteries. Um, they contain elastin fibers, meaning that they are able to stretch um, or recoil than the collagen fibers. They are thick, they're muscular, um, they're more elast elastic than the arterioles. Uh, they're less distensible, meaning that they don't really stretch. And then they expand as the blood enters during the ventricular uh, systole. And then they recoil during ventricular diastole. So whenever I mention a systole, it's a, a contraction of the heart. And diastole, it's um, relaxation of the heart. So the arterioles are the main site of resistance. Um, when vasoconstriction occurs, this causes a reduction in the blood flow within the vessel. And this therefore has an increased resistance of um, the blood flow when it's going to the capillaries. So a bit of characteristics now of the veins. The veins are known as a blood reservoir meaning that when the heart is at rest, most of the blood is contained in these veins. Again, they contain more collagen fibers than the elastin fibers. They are much larger in radius, um, and this is because of their thinner walls. They are less elastic, so therefore there's less resistance to the flow of the blood. Um, so this means that blood is able to flow through the veins smoothly. Um, they are highly distensible, or stretchable in other words. Um, they have, again, that valve like I showed you guys that prevents the backflow of blood. So blood is able to move in one direction. Um, when vasoconstriction occurs, this increases the blood flow to the heart. This is known as venous return. Um, and because of the narrowing of these veins, it squeezes out more blood that's already inside the veins. And because of the larger radius, the um, vasoconstricting of these vessels has little effect on the resistance to flow. So imagine a tube or a hose, and you're squeezing that hose as water is flowing through. Now, that tube, you guys can think of it as a vein. And in this case, the veins, um, when they're being constricted, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't um, create a big effect on the flow of the blood. So as for the mean systemic blood pressure in the veins, it is much lower than that of the arteries. And then as a side note, uh, venous return will affect the end diastolic volume. 
and the end diastolic volume is basically the volume that remains in the ventricles at the end of the ventricular relaxation. So if I move up again to show you guys the image of the heart, end diastolic volume is talking about the volume that stays here in the ventricles once a relaxation occurs. So a contraction happens, um, blood gets pumped out, and then your heart is able to relax. And then whatever blood remains here, that is known as end diastolic uh, volume. Um, so again, that end diastolic volume uh, will affect, therefore, the stroke volume. And the stroke volume is known as the volume that um, the blood is ejected in each ventricle uh, per, per beat. So again, I mentioned to you guys the systemic circuit. This is when the blood um, exits the lungs and it, it is now oxygenated. It is now able to move into the heart again and then move into the various regions of your body. So again, during systemic circulation, the aorta is the main player here. So during systemic circulation, um, the blood flows throughout the body. You start at your left atrium. So you start here on the left side. You move down the left um, ventricle, and then you go into the aorta. The aorta then transports the blood into all these other systemic organs. And then the mean arterial pressure, or MAP, is between... 83 to 100. And this is because, again, like I mentioned before, the aorta is the main component that maintains the blood flow throughout the entire cardiac cycle. So the pressure in the aorta is very high. So that means that it is able to push the blood into these various regions in our body. So as blood moves away from the heart, the pressure decreases as well. So again, we see a high pressure in the aorta. And as we move down away from the heart, um, the pressure decreases. And that's basically just what this uh, graph is showing you guys. Again, during pulmonary and during the systemic circuits, the pressure drops and it just continues to drop as we move away from the heart. But the main key component here is that the highest pressure is um, in the systemic circuit and it is due to the aorta. So now we're gonna talk about how we record blood pressure. So recording of blood pressure or mean arterial Pressure is known as MAP. So during older times, um, we would use a device known as a sphygmomanometer, and it would contain mercury. But nowadays, um, we use, again, a sphygmomanometer without the mercury, and we combine it with a stethoscope. So the sphygm sphygmomanometer is this device here. And then the stethoscope is what doctors use to hear your heartbeat. So again, this is what a stethoscope looks like. I'm sure many of you guys have seen it. If you go to a doctor, um, it contains the earpiece at the top. And then at the bottom, it contains a diaphragm or a bell, in other words, as well. Um, it is placed on the skin over the brachial artery. And then you want to listen to these tapping sounds known as Karotkov sounds. The tapping sounds um, let you know that uh, the blood is moving against blood vessels. And the first tap when this Karotkov sounds begins is called systolic pressure, or it indicates systolic pressure. And when the sound disappears or that last tap, this is known as diastolic pressure. And you guys will actually be doing this um, in your experiment next week. 
So again, um, this is what the earpiece looks like on the stethoscope. And when you guys are using the stethoscope, you want to have the earpieces away from you. Okay. So where is your brachial artery? Your brachial artery can be found on your arms. And this is where you're going to be placing the stethoscope in order to listen to these Karakoff sounds. And then you can also take blood pressure on the radial arteries. Um, this is where you can feel the pulse. So I can actually show you guys real quick. So you have your bicep. <laughs> you can't see my bicep. You have your bicep. And then like right in the middle of the bicep is where this brachial artery is located. Um, and then it moves, well, it starts off here and it moves downwards and then it branches off and it comes into the middle of the, um, the bicep area here. So you guys can, if you place your arm right above like your heart region and you place your two fingers and move down the brachial artery, you will be able to find your pulse actually. So if you guys would like to give that a try, feel free to do so. So now this is a sphygmomanometer. Um, it wraps around the upper arm. You usually wrap it about one inch above the anti-cubical fold. So the anti-cubical fold uh, is basically this region where your arm is able to fold right here. And when you place the sphygmomanometer, you want to place it around one inch above, so here. Um, and then when you wrap it, you know, nice and tight, you want to make sure that you're able to place two fingers underneath it so that way it's not too tight and not too loose. So you have this gauge as well, and you have a bulb. So the gauge is used to basically open and close, um, and then by opening it, it releases air. By closing it, it keeps and maintains the air inside. Um, the bulb, again, is used to inflate the blood pressure cuff. So I'm sure many of you guys have had your blood pressure taken before. Um, it's this portion here that gets inflated. It's like a little bag. And then it contains um, this device here known as a manometer. And it measures uh, the pressure in millimeters of mercury. So now we're going to move on to being able to estimate aortic pressure or the mean arterial pressure, also known as MEP. So the way that we usually measure mean arterial pressure is through a non-invasive method. So like I described before, we place the object on your bicep. We're not really inserting anything. We're not really cutting someone open, nothing like that. Um, we take the pressure of this brachial artery and the brachial artery is what is actually aligning with the aorta. So that's why we want to be able to measure that pressure on our brachial artery. Again, <clears throat> excuse me. Again, we use our sphygmomanometer and the stethoscope, and we listen for these tapping sounds. So when you guys are going to be doing this experiment, you guys are going to place that uh, stethoscope underneath the sphygmomanometer. And then you guys are going to be able to hear these types of sounds like. So that's what you guys should be hearing. You guys will be hearing a tap and it's going to be silent and then another tap and then silence and then another tap. And then at some point, the tap is actually going to stop. So the first tap is known as systolic pressure. And then when there is no sound afterwards, this is known as diastolic pressure. And the tapping sounds actually occur because of the vibrations along the walls of these um, uh, brachial arteries. Um, and this is caused by this turbulent flow. And I will be showing you guys an image as well. So again, you have your artery and you have your blood flow. If there is nothing um, interacting with it, the blood flow will have a laminar flow, so it'll be able to move smoothly throughout the artery. You guys will hear no sound. But if you guys use the cuff, um, 
and you guys squeeze the artery, you are restricting that flow, the blood flow. So this causes a turbulent flow. So as you guys can see, the blood starts hitting the walls, and then that's how you're able to hear these carot cough sounds. So again, you have your cuff, you have your stethoscope, which you will place on your brachial artery. You have the pressure gauge. And then you have your um, bulb with the um, basically the on and off. So when you place the pressure cuff, if it is with a pressure that is greater than 120 millimeters of mercury, um, this causes the cuff to inflate and therefore the blood flow is not able to go through. You will hear no sounds on the stethoscope. However, if the cuff pressure then uh, decreases between 80 and 120, the blood is able to flow through just a bit, but then it starts hitting the walls. And then that's how you're able to hear these carot cough sounds. And now if it's um, less than, or around the regions of 80, the blood is able to flow um, through and therefore you will not be able to hear any sounds because the artery is no longer compressed. And when we usually measure a blood pressure, we usually measure it um, systolic over diastolic and the average blood pressure is around 120 over 80. So this image here is showing you guys the highest blood pressure that is due to this systolic pressure. And this is the beginning of the sounds. Again, this is the beginning of that tapping sound. And then the lowest uh, pressure is the diastolic pressure. And this is when that sound ends. You can't hear anything anymore. And then the image below is basically just showing you guys the same thing as the previous slide. So I won't be going over that again, but if you wish to, you guys can replay that portion of the video as well. So again, this image here is also showing you guys the same thing. It's letting you know that the highest um, arterial pressure is known as systolic pressure. And then the lowest arterial pressure is known as diastolic pressure. So how do we measure arterial pressure? Um, this is known as the diastolic pressure plus one third of the pulse pressure. So these are a couple of um, equations that you guys should know or that might be on the exam. So if you guys want to add these to your study guides, feel free to do so. So again, you have your mean arterial pressure that varies with each cardiac cycle. Um, and this is due to the systolic blood pressure, which is the maximum pressure in the aorta during that ventricular systolic period. Um, this is due to the ejection of blood or when blood leaves the aorta. And it averages around 120 uh, millimeters of mercury. As for these diastolic blood pressure, this is the minimum pressure in the aorta uh, during that ventricular diastolic period. So when I mention ventricular systolic period, I mean um, when the ventricles are contracting. And when I mention ventricular diastolic period, I mean when these ventricles are relaxing. So again, um, it is not zero because of the elastic recoil. The blood is draining off of these vessels. And then the average diastolic blood pressure is around 80. <clears throat> And then there's also another um, component known as pulse pressure or PP. And this is the systolic pressure minus the diastolic pressure. So again, these are equations that you guys um, should know. And then if you guys want to add them to your study guides, again, feel free to do, or to do so. Again, another image here is showing you guys that the systolic pressure is the highest in the aorta, and then the diastolic pressure is the lowest. And as you move away from the heart, the pressure decreases. So here's an overview as well of these map equations for you guys. Um, 
It lets you know how to con uh, conduct the mean arterial pressure, the pulse pressure, the stroke volume, the cardiac output, and then the total peripheral resistance. Okay. So what happens if there are blood pressure abnormalities or what are these blood pressure abnormalities? So hypertension is when the blood pressure is above 140 um, and 90 millimeters of mercury. And there are two different types of hypertension. The first one being primary. The cause is unknown, but usually around 90% of the cases um, of individuals have primary hypertension. There's also secondary. Again, the um, cause is unknown, um, and it accounts for at most 10% of the cases of people. Then you have hypotension, and this is known as when the blood pressure is below 160 um, millimeters of mercury, and the other type of abnormality is known as orthostatic hypotension, and this is usually when there isn't enough uh, sympathetic compensation, uh, when, a, when a person moves from horizontal to vertical. So imagine when you're laying down um, in your bed or on the floor, and then you sit up very quickly. You end up having this uh, kind of feeling of weakness or a bit of dizziness. Um, and that's usually describing orthostatic hypotension. So now we are going to move on to the cardiac cycle. So this image here is showing you the heart cycles between the contractions and relaxations. So we start off in late diastole. So both sets of your um, chambers are relaxed, and then the ventricles are able to fill. So we can see here that um, the right and the left are both relaxed, and then the ventricles are able to fill up with blood. And then on the second region here, it shows us the atrial systole, um, and this is when the atrias contract and therefore blood again is able to enter the ventricles. So in both late diastole and atrial systole, it's ventricular filling. So that means that blood is entering the ventricles. And then now we are in a phase known as isovolumetric ventricular contraction. So what does this mean? This is the first phase um, that the ventricular contraction pushes, these AV valves are then closed. Um, so there's not a lot of pressure to open up the semilunar valves. So here we have uh, ventricular filling now, but there isn't enough pressure for us to exit the heart. And again, whatever volume of blood is left here, it is known as end diastolic volume. So now we move on to, to the next phase known as ventricular ejection. And again, this is when the ventricles um, contract and then the pressure then goes up. So we're able to open up the valves and we're able to exit the heart. And then whatever um, blood is left here, it is known as end systolic volume after the ven ventricular ejection occurs. And then now we are again at the isovolumetric ventricular relaxation. And then the ventricles are able to relax once more. And we're able to go back into this late diastole phase or diastole phase. Again, this image is showing you guys the same thing, but yeah, I, I like this image better than the previous one. So again, you have atrial systole, the atria is here, and then you have ventricular systole. You move into that isovolume, mm, apologies. You move on to the isovolumetric ventricular contraction. All these words, oh my gosh. <laughs> 
And then you are now at the ventricular systole. So the contraction of the ventricles happens, the pressure increases, we open up those valves and we exit the heart. And then we are at our early ventricular diastole. And then now we move on to the late ventricular diastole and we are back into that atrial systole phase. And this is where the ventricular um, filling occurs. So the blood is able to enter the ventricles. And how does this all come back into play with an ECG? Um, you have again that P wave, your QRX complex, and your T. So each of these colors represents a different phase that the heart is going through. And then at the top, it lets you know um, ventricular systolic period is around 0 0.3 seconds. And then ventricular diastolic period is around 0 0.5 seconds. And therefore, what does this mean? This means that one cardiac cycle or from one beat to the next, um, it usually lasts around 0 0.8 seconds when you are at rest. So a little bit of characteristics of this ventricular um, systolic period. Again, um, systolic meaning when it's contracting. Um, this is when the isovolumetric ventricular contraction and the ventricular ejection are occurring. So if we move back again here, you have your ventricular uh, systolic period. It's this region here. It's all of this. Okay. So during isovolumetric ventricular contraction, this is when the AV and the aortic valves are closed. Like I mentioned before, no blood is coming in or exiting these ventricles. Um, the ventricle then contracts and then the pressure is able to go up. And then due to the pressure going up, it's um, actually greater than that of the atrial pressure. So then ventricular ejection occurs. Again, it's when the pressure of the ventricles is much higher than the pressure of the arter arteries. And this causes the valves or the aortic valves to open and the blood is able to exit the ventricle and go out the aorta. Um, and then during this period is when the blood volume in the, in the aorta is increasing due to the ejection of the left ventricle, and then the blood volume increases, the aortic wall is able to expand, therefore the blood pressure in the aorta um, has reached the maximum pressure, and this is known as systolic pressure. So this is key, a key note of this slide here. So now we move on to ventricular diastolic period. Again, diastolic relaxation. Um, this is when isovolume and isovolumetric ventricular relaxation and ventricular filling are occurring. So again, during that isovolumetric ventricular relaxation, we have the AV and the aortic valves um, closed in our heart. No blood is coming in or leaving the ventricles. Um, the ventricles then relax. The pressure then is less than that of the aorta. And therefore, the pressure in the ventricles uh, drops and it is less than the arterial pressure. Again, we move on to that ventricular filling or the blood is coming into the ventricles. Um, the pressure in the atria is then greater than that of the pressure in the ventricles. So our AV valves open. Um, we are then enter a passive phase, meaning that no atria or ventricular contraction is occurring. And then we move on to a, or we continue this passive phase um, until that atrium contracts. And then when the atrium contracts, this is known as the active phase. So then the blood is able to go from the atria into the ventricles. So when the blood volume in the aorta um, goes down, uh, and this is due again to the left ventricle when it's not pumping blood, um, the wall of the aortic uh, region will recoil, and therefore the blood pressure has reached the minimum. And this is known as diastolic pressure. 
Again, another key note here of this slide. So this is more of a visual that shows you um, what happens. So again, we are here in our ventricles, a contraction occurs, the pressure increases, and we're able to exit, right? So the ventricles contract, and then the valves are able to open up. Can you guys see that? These little, um, they're kind of like doors. So they open up, the blood flows through, and the aorta expands. And therefore, the pressure here is always going to be the highest. And then it moves out into various regions of our body. So this is when the systolic pressure is recorded. So now in the opposite effect, when the ventricle reaches um, isovolumetric uh, relaxation, the ventricles then are able to expand and the aorta is able to basically relax. Right, So this causes the um, valve to close, and then the blood is able to just continue to flow into the rest of our circulatory system. And this is when the pressure is the least in the aorta, and this is known as diastolic pressure. So now I'm going to talk about some physiological factors that affect the mean arterial pressure. So again, measurement of the mean arterial pressure is known as the cardiac output multiplied by the total peripheral resistance. Another um, formula that you guys should know. So what do I mean when I talk about cardiac output? This is basically the volume of blood that is pumped by each ventricle per minute. So however much blood um, the heart is able to pump out of the ventricle in one minute. This is known as the cardiac output. How do we calculate cardiac output? Um, again, written as CO. This is known as the stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate. And then here's just a couple of more uh, key features for you guys to know. So what are some of the effects of the cardiac outputs on the mean arterial pressure? So if you have a constant MAP or a constant mean arterial pressure, the flow of the blood is able to go through. It is able to flow smoothly into your systemic organs. But if you increase that um, cardiac output, this leads, therefore, to an increased mean arterial pressure because the volume of the blood that is in the aorta increases. Therefore, this causes the total peripheral resistance uh, to stay the same, as you guys can see here. So there's a distribution of the cardiac output when it's at rest. So again, you have the right side of the heart, which contains deoxygenated blood. Um, and then you have the left side of the heart, which then um, you, when you exit the lungs, um, it becomes oxygenated. And this schematic here just shows you um, where in your body most of that blood gets taken up to. So this is just some more information for you guys to know, not really super important, but it's for your own knowledge. So now moving on to total peripheral resistance. This basically means that it is the resistance that is applied throughout the systemic circulation. So how do we calculate um, TPR? This is um, the mean arterial pressure over the cardiac output. And TPR usually depends on the radius of the arterioles. So Think of total peripheral resistance as um, when you have a hose, and depending on how wide that hose is, um, it can cause the, let's say, the flow of the fluid to either be smooth or to be much harder um, to flow through. So again, when vasoconstriction occurs, 
this increases the total peripheral resistance. So there's a higher resistance of the blood being able to flow through. If you vasodilate, then you increase, and therefore this decreases TPR. So hopefully that makes sense. But again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to email me. So again, vasoconstriction. This is um, an increased contraction of these circular smooth muscles, um, and it leads to increased resistance. So not a lot of blood is able to flow through as smoothly because the radius is decreasing. So the tube, you can think of it as it's getting smaller, smaller, and smaller. And here are some of the region, or reasons why um, this vasoconstriction takes place. So it can be due to a high myogenic activity or high oxygen, a decrease in carbon dioxide, other metabolites, um, an increase in endothelin or an increase in sympathetic uh, stimulation um, if there is vasopressin or angiotensin 2 or if you are cold. Um, as for vasodilation, again, the radius is increasing. So the blood is able to flow much, much smoothly. So the um, TPR um, decreases. And a few of these re reasons that it's caused by is due to a low myogenic activity or low oxygen, an increase in CO2, um, increase in nitric oxide. Um, if there's a decrease in this sympathetic stimulation, if you have a histamine release, or if you're just basically warm. So what are the determinants of the mean arterial pressure? Um, MAP is determined by the heart rate, the stroke volume, and the total peripheral resistance. Again, these are more um, formulas for you guys to know or for you guys to write down in case it comes back on the exam. And then this schematic just basically shows you um, the mean arterial blood pressure and all the different components that can come into play into it, okay? So now we're gonna move on to the cardiovascular center and the receptors that it contains. So again, we are at the region of the brain known as the medulla oblongata. It is the center for the blood pressure regulation, um, the cardiovascular center, the respiratory center, and the vasomotor center. So you have these arterial baroreceptors, and these baroreceptors are known as stretch receptors, um, you have these um, arterial barrel, barrel receptors. Again, um, if there's high pressure barrel receptors, you have your synoartic barrel receptors, and they are located in uh, the region near the heart, which is called the carotid sinus. And then you also have um, the aortic uh, arch region here. So your carotid sinus and your aortic arch. Again, here's another image that shows you where these baroreceptors are located, the aortic bar arch baroreceptor and the carotid sinus baroreceptor. Um, so if you guys remember this image here, it shows again the region of the brain, the medulla oblongata, and then the um, ganglionic nerves, which innervate either in the heart or into the spinal cord, and then you're able to communicate with other various regions of your body. And again, the uh, autonomic uh, nervous system and what controls it, um, it's the medulla oblongata, the region of the brain down here. Um, it is the center again for your cardiovascular, your respiratory and your vasomotor. And then you have that parasympathetic division. As you guys remember, um, this division um, dominates during your rest and digest. Um, you have a vagus nerve and it communicates with the heart or it innervates the heart. 
and you have these preganglionic neurons. Again, they are at the cranial and sacral regions. And then the postganglionic neurons secrete acetylcholine. The acetylcholine then binds to the muscarinic receptor, and the muscarinic receptors um, are found in the atrial tissue of your heart. And what does this do? It basically lowers your heart rate. It lowers the force of the contractility in the atria. And then the blood vessels actually lack the mus muscarinic receptors. So during parasympathetic division, like I mentioned, this is during the rest and digestive phase. So when you eat something and you're digesting it, it takes a long time for you to digest your food. Um, so your heart rate is fairly low. Not that, not that high. So again, another image here of your preganglionic neuron, what it releases, what it binds to on the postganglionic neuron, and then what that postganglionic neuron releases and what it binds to on the heart. And then again, you have that sympathetic division, which activates the fight or flight response. And then your um, preganglionic neurons. So I can actually move. Showing now. Yeah. Um, you have your preganglionic neurons. Um, they are located on the thoracic and lumbar regions of your body. And then you have the postganglionic neurons, which secrete neuroepinephrine. And then the adrenal medulla releases 80% um, epinephrine, and then 20 of it is actually neuroepinephrine. And they are able to bind to these receptors um, known as beta 1. They are located on the heart. And then alpha-1 receptors, which are located on these smooth muscles of your arterioles and your veins. And then you also have beta-2 receptors um, in your blood vessels, and they are able to support your heart, your skeletal muscles, um, and then the walls of the bronchioles in your lungs as well. So again, um, you have these receptors for neuroepinephrine and epinephrine that are located in the heart. Um, the beta-1 receptors, uh, they are able to bind to this uh, neuroepinephrine and epinephrine. And what does this do to your heart rate? Well, it increases it, and it also increases the force of the contractility, which therefore leads to an increase in this stroke volume. And then you have the smooth muscles of your arterioles and the veins, and this is where the alpha-1 uh, receptors are located. And alpha-1 likes to bind again to that neuroepinephrine uh, over the epinephrine. So it prefers neuroepinephrine instead of this epinephrine. Um, this causes a contraction of the smooth muscles, and it will lead to a vasoconstriction. And then now you have the blood vessels that support your heart and your skeletal muscles, as well as the walls of the bron uh, bronchioles that are located in the lungs. And these are the beta-2 receptors. And the beta-2 um, have an affinity for the epinephrine over the neuroepinephrine. This causes a relaxation of your smooth muscles, which will then lead to that vasodilation or that increase in the radius. Again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, so again, another um, visual for you guys. Um, the sympathetic division, again, is during that fight or flight response. We have your preganglionic neuron, what it releases, what it binds to on the postganglionic neuron, what that postganglionic neuron releases, and then what it binds to on the heart. And then again, um, there's another uh, preganglionic neuron, but it binds to um, the adrenal gland. And then this adrenal, uh, or I'm oh, sorry, it binds to the nicotinic receptor on the adrenal gland. And then um, the chromaphrine cell uh, secretes 80% of this epinephrine and 20% neuroepinephrine, which then goes into your bloodstream. So this table here, you guys feel free to copy it on your study guides. This is basically a summary of what uh, factors are able to control this um, mean arterial pressure. So again, what the target organ or tissue is, what hormonal factor um, or neural factors it 
contains and then what effect it has and then what influence that causes on the mean arterial pressure. So again, this is for you guys to know. It's a table that summarizes all of the factors that either increase or decrease your MAP. So what are some intrinsic factors that control? So like, what are some inner factors that control this mean arterial pressure? Well, temperature is one of them and partial pressure of carbon dioxide is another one. So as for temperature, if you're cold, you um, your arterials will vasoconstrict. If you're hot, they will cause vasodilation. As for the partial pressure of CO2, if there is high partial pressure of CO2, this will cause vasodilation. And if there's a low partial pressure of CO2, this causes vasoconstriction. So now we're gonna move on to the regulation of the MAP by your autonomic nervous system and intrinsic control. So again, you have your heart. If there is an increased sympathetic tone, or increased fight or flight. Um, this causes uh, the neuroepinephrine or epinephrine to bind at the atrial and ventricular tissues. So what receptor um, does it bind to? It binds to the beta one. What effect does it have on your heart? It increases the heart rate. It increases the force. It increases the stroke volume. It increases the cardiac output. Therefore, it increases your mean arterial pressure. And then the reason of how this is all done, of course, you guys can read that for yourselves. And then it has um, the uh, opposite now with the parasympathetic tone. So what happens if you increase parasympathetic activity? This causes a release of acetylcholine. The acetylcholine binds to the atrial tissue only, so the region at the top of our heart. What receptor does it bind to? Um, it binds to that muscarinic receptor. And what effect does it have on our heart? It decreases our heart rate. It decreases our force of contractility. Um, in the atria, it decreases that cardiac output and it decreases MEP. So again, you guys can think of it um, intuitively. So by sympathetic, fight or flight. So, um, a scenario that you guys can think of is, again, for example, if I were to tell you guys that you guys have an exam, this will most likely cause your heart rate to increase um, and you are in that fight or flight response. So are you either going to stay and take the exam or are you going to leave and <laughs> grab your stuff and go? Um, so your heart rate increases. It's getting your body ready to decide on what it should do. As for parasympathetic, again, it's during that uh, rest and digest uh, phase. Um, it causes the heart to decrease and the force of the contractility to also decrease. As for the veins, if there is an increase in the sympathetic activity, this leads to an increase in neuroepinephrine as well as epinephrine. The receptor that it binds to is alpha-1, and again, alpha-1 prefers neuroepinephrine over that epinephrine. What effect does it have? vasoconstriction, and then the um, other effects that it has on venous return, uh, end diastolic volume, the stroke volume, cardiac, and the mean arterial pressure. Um, and then as well, what happens if you decrease uh, the sympathetic activity it has the opposite effect. Um, but now the receptor that it binds to is the beta-2, which causes vasodilation. And then it leads to all these various other effects. So again, this is another um, uh, flow chart that you guys can copy onto your study guides if you guys wish to do so. And then now moving on to, again, your arterioles, uh, the effects that it has if you increase the sympathetic tone. Um, it increases neuroepinephrine as well as epinephrine. And then the uh, receptor that it would bind to is the alpha-1. And then the effect that it has on the smooth muscle cells is that they vasoconstrict. 
and by vasoconstriction again if you think of it as the um, two being squeezed this causes resistance the blood flow to the capillaries therefore decreases and therefore this leads to an increase in that um, map um, as for the arterioles if there is a decrease in that sympathetic activity it leads to the opposite effect but now the receptor that it binds to is beta 2 and then it causes vasodilation, so the radius of the um, of the smooth muscles uh, increases, and therefore this causes the TPR to uh, decrease, and it leads to a decrease in the mean arterial pressure as well. Um, so now we can go over. Um, the main ideas of what you guys are going to be doing for your lesson six um, on blood pressure and the experiment. And I will also be going over this with you guys during class. So you guys won't feel as lost. And again, you guys do have your lab protocols with you either online or in person on your desks. As for the experiments, you guys are going to be doing three different activities. Um, you will be sitting. And when you are sitting, you will be taking three readings of this systolic pressure, as well as the diastolic pressure and the pulse rate or your heart rate. And then after three minutes um, while sitting, you guys will take one reading of the systolic pressure as well as the diastolic pressure and your pulse rate. And then after um, immediately after standing, you will take one reading of that systolic pressure as well as the diastolic pressure and the pulse rate. And then after three minutes while you are standing, you will take one reading of that systolic pressure, the diastolic pressure and the pulse rate. And then again, you will be doing um, the same thing after uh, immediately after you sit. And then when you are standing at rest, as well as when you are exercising, you'll take a reading um, before the exercise and then three minutes after the exercise and then after another three minutes of exercise. So the main goal here is to observe the before, the during, and after. Um, here are a few of the expected results for you guys. Um, during orthostatic posture, you'll be having negative feedback mechanisms based on the effect of these um, autonomic nervous system. So again, this is a flowchart for you guys to follow, but I will most likely be going through this um, in class for you guys, just so it makes a little bit more sense and it's much easier to follow along. Um, so we can go over that next week. Um, so for now, let me just stop sharing. So again, this lecture video is for you to watch um, in your own time. Just make sure you watch it before next week. And then we will be conducting the blood pressure um, experiment uh, on Tuesday of next week. Yeah. So have a good night. <laughs> it is actually nine here when I am recording. So I wish you guys a great rest of your week or whenever you are watching this. Um, and I will see you all on Tuesday. Bye bye.